Hallelujah. Turn please to the Gospel of John in chapter 3. God is good. Amen. I have to say that this is the most encouraged I've ever been since I've been coming here for the last, since 2005. The fact that people are willing to become fools for Christ. You know, that, that there is something about the Word of God that is very clear, but there is a, there is a spirit that says, yeah, but is it really for today? Is it really for you? And that has been something because of the um, Toronto stuff and all that, and the excesses and the charismatic Pentecostal movement, that has got people to withdraw from coming boldly to the throne of grace. Because we don't want to be affected and tainted by something that is other. But that has been the work of the enemy, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he saves today, and he saved in the apostolic times, if he healed in apostolic times, he heals today. And the whole idea of having a theology that just has a, a biblical philosophy without the power of God is what has robbed the church of the dynamic and the witness. When I got saved, I made a decision that every word in here has got to be true. If it isn't, I don't want any of it. And I came across Mark chapter 16, and you, people have heard this before, and right at the end it says, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Those who believe and are baptized shall be saved, those who do not believe shall be damned. And these signs will follow them that believe. In my name they will cast out devils, they will speak with new tongues, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And then the theologians tell me that it's not so well. I've experienced these things, I've seen them happen. The devil is the same, he hasn't changed. And to deprive the church of that power makes us just like offering people a philosophy to make them feel good about their condition. The power of God to save and the power of God to heal has not changed because God hasn't changed. The fact that we don't receive it does not nullify the Word of God. Okay? I mean, we pray for people for years and years and years and they don't get saved. Do we say God doesn't save today? Yeah. So why, does it, so why is it like that for healing? It's because the devil comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. I've come that you might have life. You might have it to the full. And so if you start saying things today that you believe that God heals, you're immediately seen as charismatic nut or something like that, because it doesn't happen. Well, it does happen. It might not happen in, my, in your experience. It might not, I mean, if God had not healed me in the last 38 years and time to time, I wouldn't be able to stand here today. And I, I'm not made of anything any better than anyone else in this room. It is the faith of God, okay? It's the faith. When that woman reached out and touched Jesus, something came from Jesus and touched her, okay? So, okay, she reached out in faith. It was the power of God. It's a, and if you deny the power of God in other areas of your life, why would you have the power of God in healing? Can you see what I'm saying? That the, the power of the Holy Spirit is what does all the work in the church today. And if we discount the Holy Spirit, then we can't go for other things. It's not like a, a sweet shop where you can pick and choose what you want. Like I'm getting in my hobby house again. John chapter 3. <laughs> Are you with me? John chapter 3, I'm going to uh, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, 
We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do those miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that which we, that we know, which we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man had ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's worth a hallelujah. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Nicodemus had come to the peak of his spiritual powers. He was a, a, men, a member of the Sanhedrin. He, he was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the top spiritual people. They fasted twice a week. They thanked God they weren't like other people. They were spiritual giants. There was, there was nowhere else Nicodemus could go. But he sees this young man about 30 years old. 30, 30 is young to me now. And he said, it's amazing. He does miracles. He does things that I've never been able to do. I could never attain to. I could never reach it in spite of all my spirituality, in spite of all my Bible knowledge. He was a teacher of Israel. So he came to Jesus and said, what's this really about? And he says, you must be born again. And of course, Nicodemus and his understanding is beginning to question and Jesus challenges him. He says, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? Turn with me to uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. Are you still with me? Ezekiel chapter 36. And again, this is the prophet... <coughs> And he's speaking to Israel, Israel and Judah. And he's saying, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. I will sp sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Okay? This is a promise that he made to Israel that he was going to cleanse them and put his spirit within them. Now Nicodemus should be able to understand this but obviously the Pharisees were caught up in their own idea of the Messiah. And the issue of being born again is, is that we receive forgiveness of sins and then we have this spirit which is the spirit of God that comes to dwell within us. It cannot happen by our striving. It cannot happen by anything else except God's sovereign will. That from the beginning of the world, before he said, light be, he saw you and you and you and me. 
and he made a decision and he sent his son way before he was born in Bethlehem. It was in the mind of God. Redemption was in the mind of God before the fall. Redemption didn't come as God, oh dear, look what Adam's done, I've got to do something. Jesus was not plan B. Jesus was plan A. Okay? Had Adam not sinned, his children would have done. Sin would have come into the world because that's what's in the nature of man. It's in the nature of man because had there not been a devil on the earth to question God's authority, Adam would have been fine. Has God said, I forgive all your sins and heal all your diseases? Has God said, you shall not eat of that fruit? If he said that, he's got an ulterior motive. He doesn't want you to be like him. And that's a lie, isn't it? Because through the redemption in the blood, the forgiveness of sins, we have been partakers of the divine nature. He has called us into sonship. It's something that the children of Israel didn't have. They were a chosen people, a chosen nation. But through the new birth, he brought us into a reality of heavenly places. So God is actually sharing his divine, his divine nature. We are not what we used to be. Okay? So he then gives us a wisdom that's from another place. He gives us a power that's from another place. We cannot attain to, we cannot work it up. Religion is always trying to work things up. Salvation is a free gift. The surrogate's heal is a free gift. You get healed, it's a free gift. You get saved, it was a free gift. Because God chose to bless. And we have to have a mind about how God, how God is towards his people. And I grew up in religion, so I always had, a bad, I always had this view of, that I have to be good enough to receive things from God. I've quit on that. <laughs> because I'll never be good enough. We can never merit the things that God has for us. The reason we don't receive very often is not because of necessarily because of sin in our lives. It's because we have an adversary. You know, sometimes I forget they have an adversary. I always think it's me. And very often it is me, but <laughs> You know, and, and, and suddenly we're preaching, you know, I've, I've, I've learned to find, the adversary is not beginning to reveal himself, and so far he hasn't won. But it's there, and it's always, it's always trying to say, this, this thing's not going to happen. You're not going to make it. And because we have, I have a low self-esteem, I tend to believe it. Then I realize it's not, my, it's not even my voice. And I just, I don't even talk to the devil now, see. Thank you, Lord, the devil knows that his time is short. Hallelujah. And he goes away. His time is short. So, you know, there's going to come a time where he's going to be bound for a thousand years. He will have no more say in the affairs of men. And we will see that kingdom. And after a thousand years, he will be loosed out of his prison. And he will go and he'll deceive men again because man is stupid. The lie that if, it, that, you know, if there was a paradise, man would not rebel against God. No, he will rebel against God because that's what's in him. Because he, we have an adversary whose sole purpose is to undermine the integrity of God. When he was cast out from heaven, he went straight for Adam. Because Adam was made in the image of God. We, you and I are made in the image of God. Man was made in the image of God. But because we fell, we were then hopeless and helpless. So we invented a, a religion, because deep down everyone knows, I don't care about atheists and what they say, deep down everyone knows that there is a God. And deep down everyone knows that they have to 
somehow get to this God. And so we have religion. But the gospel of the grace of God, he says, when we were yet dead in our trespasses, in our sins, he made us alive. He quickened us. Lazarus was in the grave four days. After four days, he says, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus comes out. What do the people say? Let's kill Lazarus, because people are following Jesus now. They say, oh, wow, this is fantastic. He must be the Messiah. This thing in the heart of man, this evil heart of unbelief, is rife. Because man will not submit to God. He will not yield to God. And it's only through the gospel where God actually conquers our heart and we begin to move with the things that God is doing in our lives that we can then step out in the dynamic that he has called us to live in. So we're not settling for something less. There is a whole pressure on, on, on the church and it, it, it's, it's always been there. It's, it's been there right from when religion took over, what Christianity was seen as, as, as the Pope. Then it was seen as the Reformation. Then it was seen... This is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Each one of us is called to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you do not develop that relationship, you will become weak. Okay? That's just the way it is. And the devil will give you every other reason not to develop that relationship. This person's in need, that person's in need, your family, there's every other thing, your job. And time is the most precious thing that we have. What you do with your time will discover, you know, will be the outcome of your life. People go to university, they spend a lot of time, they get a degree. Well, they didn't get that degree by sitting around. They invested into that time. And the time that you invest with Jesus is what will come out of you. It doesn't happen automatically. We are saved once and for all. But the grace, we have to receive mercy and grace as an ongoing thing. And for that, we have to present ourselves because we're living in this present evil world where we imbibe defilement. Well, I do. <laughs> By the very nature of where we live. Not because we're sinful necessarily. But this defilement causes us not to receive things from God. So Paul tells us, to cleanse yourself for every defilement of the flesh and the spirit. Perfecting holiness. Mm. And what happens then? People try to become holy people. That's not what he's saying. Present yourself to God and the blood of Jesus will start working. The blood of Jesus is as effective today as it will be tomorrow, as it was yesterday. And if you don't put faith in the blood, you'll put faith in yourself. You will try to make yourself a better person. And all those things will just make you more and more frustrated. In the end, you just give up on God and you'll settle for something that's, well, less. God doesn't think less of you. God, God will never think more of you now than he does. He loves you completely. He demonstrated that love once and for all when you received his son and he brought us into sonship. He's never going to love us more than this. And he's certainly not going to love us less. The love of God is constant. So it's not about trying to earn the love of God. It's about trying to destroy the works of the devil. It's trying to walk away from the shackles that we have allowed, either through ignorance or through bad teaching or through whatever, or even through sin. But the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. It's the eternal power of the blood. It's an eternal salvation. It's an eternal glory, and it is the eternal spirit. 
The eternal has no beginning, has no end. We've been brought into something that is greater than we could ever imagine. And so this morning, I was really, I was really thrilled that you know, people stepped out and people were willing to pray and all that stuff. Because that's what body ministry is about. You know, if we just go to church and somebody leads a meeting, somebody preaches, and, and then we go home, there is not necessarily, you know, our love for each other will grow as we minister to each other. Because, you know, like Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So when we give, somebody receives something, and then we, and whenever you give, God always replaces it. God is no debtor to anyone. If you give money, God will replace it. If you give time, God will replace it. But ultimately, we belong to him. Our, our life is not our own. Our time is not our own. Because he has done something phenomenal. So when he, when he was promising Israel that he would cleanse them from their sin and that he would put the spirit within them, Ezekiel probably had no idea what he was talking about because they were still under the law and they were still under judgment. And God is promising something way beyond what the natural man can think. So by the time Nicodemus comes up, he's just as lost as the natural man. You talk to the natural man in the street and you say, you must be born again. He's not going to understand any more than anything else. You, you spoke to me before I was saved about being born again. I wouldn't know what you're talking about. I only understand a new birth because I have been born again. I only understand the power of the Spirit because I've received the power of the Spirit and I've seen the demonstration of it. I, I cannot work it out. I cannot convince somebody who is dead in their trespasses or somebody who, who wants to live a Christian life in their own strength that they need the power of God. I need the power of God. I thank God that I had nothing to offer when I got saved. So I needed everything God had for me. You know. He is all my righteousness. I stand complete in him and worship him. That song really touched me this morning. There was a whole lot of stuff, you know, that came up this morning from Romans, from Romans chapter 4, that he gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist into being. Can you understand that God is just speaking right through the meeting? And so when I come here, I usually have an idea of what I'm going to talk about, but I try to connect with what is actually happening so that it becomes relevant. I don't have a message ready for you so you could be impressed with my eloquence. You've never been impressed with my eloquence. But when you leave here this morning, we must walk away with some idea that we have met with the living God. Otherwise, we've just spent time away from home. So, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to close here because if, if people want to continue receiving ministry, I'm going to just hand it over. If you, people need prayer, for whatever reason. You know, it's very hard to come, for, come forward and admit that you need prayer. So Cyril did, you know, Thank God for Cyril, because he stepped out. Yeah. It's, it's very humbling to ask someone to pray for you. And I understand, I never let people pray for me, so I shouldn't be talking. Yeah? I understand what it's like. I'm very proud. I don't like people praying for me. I don't mind praying for people. But that's what it is. We need to humble. He says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. How do we resist the devil? By humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Amen?